My name is Jason Atkinson. I've lived my life exploring wild places, and for some reason, I connect with people who make their living off the beaten path. Most tend to choose this life, and I want to know why. Join me in my search for the man out. I love to be in the outdoors, where the space is big and honest. Out here, I'm mostly alone, but the souls I do encounter have some big personalities. Put the camera on me, damn it! Breathe! Breathe, young man! Breathe! Throwing knives is an art. And I'm very good at it. 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, 22, 24, 25, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> Sometimes these people are here for the seclusion, the unbridled beauty, the wilderness. And sometimes you're out here just to escape. This week I'm in the Aleutian Islands of Alaska. You could argue this is the end of the earth, roughly 600 miles west of Anchorage to a town called Nelson Lagoon, which sits on a narrow sand spit at the start of the Aleutian Islands, then another 40 miles down a black beach on ATVs. It takes a lot to get here. The whole town of Nelson Lagoon came out for the weekly landing, but with the tide coming in, we needed to get down beach before we'd have to stay the night in this tin shed. An hour in, and our only company has been the local wildlife, living and dead. Camp is three tents, two with heaters, one shower, one outhouse with a beachfront view and a Sears catalog. Out here, everything has to have a purpose to make it on the trip, and that includes the people. We have big guns, sat phones, diesel fuel, coffee, some duct tape, and one band-aid. Out here, that's all we need. Personally, I prefer this to any five-star accommodations. Joining me this week is outdoor publisher Pat Hoagland, guide Gray Struznik, and Captain Josh Wickbull. My friend Pat is always the man in, a busy dad, a publisher of outdoor magazines like Traveling Angler, Salmon Steelhead Journal, Western Hunting Journal, Steelheaders Journal. Pat has a great sense of humor, but I can feel he's under a heavy burden. Josh is an offshore captain in Homer, Alaska. This week he's the middleman, which means if there's a problem, it's his problem. What makes this place different from other places you've got? There's just, there's no one out here. It's not full of people, you're not fighting crowds. It's, you're just all by yourself out here out the, on the river. I mean, the only competition we have out here is each other, you know, I mean, for the most part. It's just, you know, two clients and a guide, and you don't see anyone else. There's not six airplanes landing here and people racing you upriver. Like his dad, Gray is a full-time guide from the northwest tip of Washington State in the Olympic Peninsula. One could argue that his hometown is the last refuge for wild fish. 
Why did you become a god? It was kind of one of those things where it's like following in your father's footsteps a little bit. Um, also, I was a little bit of a troublemaker when I was a kid, so this kind of helped you know, shape who I was and keep me out of trouble. This keeps you out of trouble? It kept me out of trouble, yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. They say a fisherman is described as someone who fishes all the time, no matter what. I've been a fisherman fascinated with Pacific steelhead since I was 13. Water is my home a safe place. I'm comfortable here. I don't know why. I have to fish. I just do. Here the sea and the sky seamlessly bleed together. The tundra has no trees. The winds that blow across my face started in Russia and Japan. The only change here is the occasional eruption of volcanoes that are 50 miles away. The water is low and clear and we're fishing the tides. These fish are untouched by modern man. Their DNA has not been altered by a hatchery. These fish have not been caught to extinction. These fish are wild and free. Somebody need to respect this fishery in order for you to trust them? Yeah, I think that if you have a respect for something, what this place is, you know, your actions that you have on the river and with the fish, I think definitely reflects on who you are as a person. We're on our way to fish another river when we came across a walrus carcass. Let me teach you a new word, usik. Usik is a native word for pecker bone, and the walrus pecker bone is the largest of all mammals. I had to have it. These bones make great reel seats, sconce lights, door pulls, even the ultimate candle holder for Thanksgiving dinner. <laughs> Let me tell you, walrus foreskin is tough. People in my home state had a similar predicament once. Back in 1970, an A-10 whale washed up on shore and someone had a bright idea. Let me teach you another word, dumbass. The problem was dynamite didn't vaporize the whale. Huge chunks of whale blubber rained down. It might be concluded that should a whale ever wash ashore in Lane County again, those in charge will not only remember what to do, they'll certainly remember what not to do. To set the record straight, I learned it's illegal in Alaska to cut the bone from rotting flesh, so I was forced to just let it be. But I still want one. Pat's parents met in Alaska, and he grew up learning how special America's 49th state really is. But Pat has been more quiet and somber than usual, and for a good reason. Yeah, my dad was a good man. I just lost him uh, about a month ago. The morning that he died, I spent the day before the entire day with my dad sitting with him, kind of talking to him, stroking his head, kissing him, telling him that I loved him. And he was afraid to die for a variety of different reasons. And we had a really good talk and I said, Dad, when it's time to go, it's okay. And I think 
he needed that permission. He needed me to say goodbye to him because I left him at about 6.30 that night. I went home and uh, I got a call at 5.30 in the morning and uh, he said that he passed. And so I think it was kind of the closure that he needed. And so I, I feel really good about where I was with him and the relationship that I had. He spent a lot of time with us, my family. Um, and, you know, he loved his, his grandchildren, my two kids. Uh, loved them fiercely. And so, you know, you get up here and you get time to reflect and think about things that are important. You know, like I said, you get away from everything, the cell phones, the emails, the day-to-day the -day operations of running a small business, family, friends, and you get to kind of recharge your batteries. I mean, that's, uh, that's one of the great things about coming out the middle of nowhere. You know, if we're doing this at home, you know, we probably all would have looked at our, our phone, checked our email six, seven times a day. You don't get that opportunity up here, which is, which is a blessing. And so, you know, you're just here by yourself with friends and with a wonderful fish. And if they're cooperating, which they have been, it's a, it's a good, it's a good break and it's a good time to be, you know, be up here and not thinking about much other than whether or not you have the right fly on. A few years ago I had just got back from Iraq and I was helping this guy fix his bike in my shop. He had forgotten to tell me there was a 38 Special in the bag under the seat. So when I put the bag on the floor, the gun went off and it hit me point blank in the right leg, severing my artery and blowing my femur apart. I'm laying there, bleeding out, not knowing what had just happened. My wife ran into the shop, found a rubber tube and she used it as a tourniquet. When the paramedics arrived, they couldn't find a pulse. I was fading away, leaving this world. And that's about the last thing I remember. There was good news and bad news. My wife had saved my life, but it didn't look like they were going to be able to save my leg. They said they'd have to amputate it. I told them no. I didn't feel anything in my leg or my foot for months and it took a year and a lot of surgeries for me to be able to walk again. At the time I was in the Senate and people from around the state made jokes of the whole thing. They said that I had shot myself. I've never even seen the gun. It's disheartening to experience abandonment when you're really down, but it taught me a lot about people and pain. These wild places hold their own lesson. How to let go. Today I choose to live life at its fullest. I choose every day to be grateful. One day we took an afternoon away from the fish to go on an Easter egg hunt. You see, back in the 1840s, until the invention of plastic and styrofoam, fishermen from Norway, Japan, and Russia used these glass balls to keep their nets riding high up in the water. Today, these things are treasures, and they're hard to find on the beaches in the lower 48. But here, they're plentiful. If 
you're expecting a Christmas present from me this year and you're watching this, look surprised. The sad part is, out here on the edge of the earth looking for glass balls, you can't help but notice all the plastic trash that is washed up on shore. Gatorade bottles, plastic bags, the only man-made stuff that will never disintegrate. Once you notice it, you can't stop seeing it. The good news is, is being out here, being alone, and knowing how to fool a steelhead certainly has its rewards. People ask me, so who's the man out? They're not just poor and uneducated. No, they're in every strata of society. Alienated from work, isolated in relationships, marginalized in this connected world that we all live in. People left out, just going through the motions, trying to survive. To be honest, like when I come up here, it's more of pushing all that aside. It's a way to come out here, unplug, and, and I don't mean to sound cliche or anything, but like it's be one with nature, you know? It's like there's nothing else out here except for you and, and the clients and the fish. And the bears. And the bears, yeah. Yeah. If there's fish, there's bears. People ask me all the time if I'm afraid. And my answer is always respectful, honest, and humble. If you believe me, no, I'm not afraid. I've nearly bled to death, supposed to never walk again. I've seen the dangerous parts of this world and been abandoned by nearly everyone I ever trusted. I've been looked over and looked through. I've been vilified and publicly shamed and I'm still here. The weird thing for me right now, I trust this bear more than I trust most people, but I'm hopeful that if I keep searching, that can change. <laughs>